This video is an absolute speed run of the acids and bases topic with everything from pH to indicators to titrations to buffer calculations. Um, it's intended as a final run through before an end of topic test or maybe even your A-level exams. So I'm not going into a huge amount of detail and I'm not talking through every step of the calculations. If you are interested in that, then I have a massive acids and bases playlist where I go through everything really sequentially, but this is really here for your final last minute cram. You should know three different definitions for acids and bases, each of which gets steadily broader. The Arrhenius definition of an acid is most similar to the GCSE one, and it's where we say that acids are substances that dissolve in water to release hydrogen ions. But the Arrhenius definition of a base is substances that release hydroxide ions in solution. And we'd recognise that as a definition for alkalis because it excludes insoluble bases like metal oxides and metal carbonates. The Bronsted-Lowry definition is the one that is introduced in this chapter, and it says that an acid is a substance that donates a proton and a base is a substance that accepts it. This means that the acid and the base don't need to dissolve, so hydrogen chloride gas reacting with ammonia can still be counted as an acid. It also depends on how the chemical is acting right now, not just what it could hypothetically do. Arrhenius acids like nitric acid and sulfuric acid can react together, and in this situation, one of them, it happens to be sulfuric acid, is functioning as an acid because it's donating a proton, but the other one here, nitric acid, is functioning as a Bronsted-Lowry base because it's accepting a proton. Now, when nitric acid accepts a proton from sulfuric acid and forms a positively charged ion, we call this a conjugate acid, and the ion that's left over is the conjugate base. We can put these together as conjugate acid base pairs, which basically means that they've both come from the same original species. So the sulfuric acid and the hydrogen sulfate ion are one conjugate acid base pair and the nitric acid and the nitro oxonium ion are the other conjugate acid base pair. The Lewis definition for an acid doesn't actually appear until the transition metal topic, but it's even more general than Bronsted-Lowry, and it is that an acid is an electron pair acceptor. This even applies to chemicals that don't interact with hydrogen ions at all. For instance, boron when it makes halides or aluminium chloride, which is electron deficient and is able to take on a fourth chloride ion or transition metals when they form complex ions. In addition to recalling those three definitions, you should also be able to describe the difference between strong acids like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid and nitric acid and weak acids like citric acid, carbonic acid and the carboxylic acids. Weak acids dissociate only slightly in aqueous solution. The pH scale is a measure of the amount of hydrogen ions in a unit volume in solution. In other words, the concentration of hydrogen ions. We always give the number of pH to two decimal places. One whole integer different on the pH scale means a tenfold change in the hydrogen ion concentration because this is an exponential scale. We express concentration using square brackets and the pH scale is a negative logarithmic scale of the hydrogen ion concentration, which means that as the numbers of the pH scale get smaller, the concentration of hydrogen ions gets higher. And also we should be aware that the scale doesn't have a top or a bottom end. pH 7 doesn't necessarily mean neutral. It does at 298 Kelvin, but at other temperatures, the pH of neutral will actually be a slightly different number. The neutral point is always wherever the number of hydrogen ions is equal to the number of hydroxide ions. In almost every question in the acids and bases topic, you'll be asked to calculate pH from hydrogen ion concentration, which we do using this formula. You might also be asked to just define pH, in which case what the exam board are looking for is you to write out this expression. When you're using this expression to calculate, on your calculator, you need to either use a designated log 10 button or a regular log button and specify that the base is 10. Then whatever answer you get, you need to multiply this by minus one. So if we wanted to work out the pH of a hydrogen ion concentration that was given, then we would do this like this. And as we've said, we would give that answer to two decimal places. But remember, it's hydrogen ion concentration you're using, not just moles. So in a particular question, you might be given or might have worked out the moles, and you might then need to divide that by the volume to get the concentration. And then you can apply that to the calculation. The second tier of pH calculations are those in which you first need to complete either a dilution or a neutralization reaction. Start by working out the moles of your initial solution, then calculate any change based on any chemical reactions and calculate the new concentration. Then go back to our original pH calculation. 
For a reaction featuring a neutralization, we would start off in the same way by working out our moles of hydrogen ions, then work out our moles of hydroxide ions and work out what the excess of the hydrogen ions is. In a few minutes, we'll get to the situation if we've got an excess of hydroxide ions because then we need some further information. I can then work out a new concentration based on that remaining excess of hydrogen ions and then that can be plugged into my pH calculation. At all times, water is functioning as both an acid and a base, because even though water is fundamentally a covalent compound, actually it's able to dissociate into hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. In reality, a hydrogen ion never actually stays on its own for long. Instead, it forms a dative bond with another water molecule to make an oxonium ion, or it's also called hydronium or hydroxonium. Because this is a reversible reaction and it's forming an equilibrium, we can write an equilibrium expression for this. As per usual, we've got square brackets to represent concentration and the products on the top and the reactants on the bottom. Even though water can dissociate to form hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, and this is happening all the time, it's happening in a very small percentage of cases. The vast majority of the water remains intact, and that means that the concentration of water is much larger than the concentration of hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions. So when the equilibrium shifts, say because the temperature changes, the concentration of water doesn't even move by 1%. So there's basically no point in including it in the expression, but we can't just leave it out and still call that Kc. So instead, we use a different expression called Kw, also known as the ionic product of water. And this is the same as our Kc expression, except that we've omitted the denominator. Now, if we were to look up a delta H value for this equilibrium, we would see that the forward reaction is slightly endothermic, which means as the temperature increases, the equilibrium shifts to the right and Kw gets larger. So without any chemical reaction happening, the pH will be getting lower because there are more hydrogen ions because more of the water molecules have dissociated. We mainly use Kw for working out the pH of alkaline solutions. This could be an unadulterated alkaline solution, such as some aqueous sodium hydroxide, or it could be the result of a neutralisation reaction where the hydroxide ions were in excess. Let's say that we weren't actually given the concentration of our alkali and we had to work it out first of all. We could use the MR to work out um, the number of moles and then we could put that together with the volume to work out a concentration. And then we use our KW expression and we use the stated value of KW. Um, you might have learned 1 times 10 to the minus 14, but that's only relevant at 298 Kelvin. And we substitute in the concentration of hydroxide ions that we've just worked out to give us a value for the concentration of hydrogen ions. And that then goes into our pH equation. Next, we're going to think again about those weak acids. Ka, also known as the acid dissociation constant, is a specific example of Kc, but for weak acids. So as we know, a weak acid will dissolve to produce a few hydrogen ions and anions. And so we can write an expression for Ka that looks like this. Or if we took a specific example like ethanoic acid, we would have our hydrogen ions and also the ethanoate ions on the top and then the undissociated acid down below. The weaker the acid is, the smaller the value of Ka will be. And any Ka value smaller than one implies a weak acid because it tells you that there is a higher concentration of the undissociated acid than of the ions that it breaks up into. Ka values are usually written in standard form because they're going to be pretty tiny. Strong acids tend not to have a published Ka value because Ka would tend to infinity, so it's not a meaningful number. Before we start using Ka to calculate pH, we're going to make two key assumptions. The first assumption is, provided we've got a pure weak acid that hasn't had any base or any salt added to it, then the concentration of the hydrogen ions and the anions is the same. Rather than having both of them in my expression, I can simplify it and I can then use the concentration of hydrogen ions twice. We won't be able to make this assumption if we start looking at neutralisation reactions or adding salts to make buffers. The second assumption is that because the amount of dissociation is so small, the initial concentration of the undissociated acid is constant, and I can use the value given in the question in my calculation. So a simple question would ask me to calculate the pH of a weak acid. I can write an expression like this because this is just a weak acid with nothing added to it. So I substitute in the numbers from the question, and I can rearrange this to give me a value for the hydrogen ion concentration. And that, of course, can go into my pH calculation. And I give the answer to two decimal places. pH indicators are chemicals that change colour in response to pH. When we're picking a good indicator, we want something that has a distinct colour change. Think about the fact that you would never use a universal indicator for a titration because you can't tell exactly where the colour change is. 
The end point is identifiable by a sharp colour change, and that occurs when you add a single drop of acid or base. The end point of the titration, where we see the colour change of the indicator, can be used as a surrogate for the equivalence point, which is where the hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions are equal. If it's a good indicator, then they will occur at the same time, but this won't always be the case. Different pH indicators change colour at different pHs, and so we use different indicators depending on what the reaction mixture is. Say, a strong acid and weak base will need a different indicator compared to a weak acid and strong base. You should be able to recognise, annotate and even draw titration curves for any combination of strong or weak acids or bases being added to strong or weak acids or bases. In this example, we're adding a strong base to a weak acid. Initially, there is a sharp rise because the solution is not yet buffering. Then we see a more gradual rise in pH as the acid is in great excess compared to the base. Within one to two centimetres cubed of the equivalence point, there is suddenly a sharp rise in the pH. There's a very sharp increase in pH, which is caused by addition of one drop of base. And this is where we're going to find our equivalence point right in the centre of that vertical region. Then after that, there is a more gradual rise in pH as further base is added and there's very little change in pH as the base is already in great excess. You may be asked to identify which titration curve corresponds to which reactants. So you need to think about what the pH is. For this first example, we can see that we're starting with a very strong base because we have a very high pH and we're finishing with a strong acid so that's being added because we have a very low pH. Where you have a weak acid or a weak base, of course, that's going to have less of an impact on the pH. pH buffers are solutions that resist changes to pH when a small amount of either acid or base is added. They may be acidic or they may be basic. Acidic buffers, which can buffer pHs below 7, are based on the equilibrium that happens when a weak acid dissolves in aqueous solution and associates to make anions. Ethanoic acid splits apart to make ethanoate ions and hydrogen ions, which I'm representing with the red rectangle. Weak acids only slightly dissociate in solution, so there is a lot of the undissociated ethanoic acid and very little of the products. A small amount of base will react to remove hydrogen ions. This affects a change in the equilibrium, so the system will shift to counteract that change, and the same number of moles of acid as the moles of base will now dissociate into anions and hydrogen ions. So the concentration of hydrogen ions is almost exactly back to where it was before, but taking into account the fact that we've got slightly increased volume. But the concentration of ethanoic acid has decreased and the concentration of anions has increased. Now let's reset back to where we started and add some acid. By adding a small amount of acid, we're adding more hydrogen ions. The system will shift to counteract that change and remove them by joining back up with the ethanoate ions to make more ethanoic acid. An acidic buffer is more typically made from a mixture of weak acid and a salt. I've added extra ethanoate ions, and there are two ways to do this. One is by mixing the weak acid with a solution of a salt containing the anions, such as sodium ethanoate, and the other way is to make that salt by adding a strong base like sodium hydroxide to the weak acid, which would then react to form the salt. Likewise, basic buffers are made from the weak base and a salt of that base. You should be able to calculate the pH of three different types of buffer and also the pH of that buffer following the addition of acid or base. For any pH buffer calculation, start by writing an expression for Ka, then identify the anion concentration and the acid concentration and use these with Ka to calculate the hydrogen ion concentration, which can then go into your pH calculation. You might see a question like this, where you have to work out the concentration based on the mass and they often also give you the temperature, which is completely irrelevant information in this case. So we write an expression for Ka, we work out what the concentration of our salt is going to be, then we can substitute that in along with the concentration of the acid that was given in the question, and this allows us to work out a concentration of hydrogen ions, and that can go into my pH equation, and that gives me a final answer of 4.17. You could be asked to do this in reverse and work out the mass of the solid salt added. As ever, I start with an expression for Ka and then figure out where I can substitute in some numbers. So I have the concentration of the acid from the question and I can use my pH to work in reverse and work out the concentration of hydrogen ions, which can also be substituted in. Then I can rearrange this to get an expression for the concentration of the anions. And based on that, I can work out the moles of the anions 
and then I need to use masses Mr Mole so I would use the MR which in this instance is given in the question to work out a mass which here I've been asked to convert into milligrams. Instead of a solid salt you could be given a salt solution. This is obviously going to change the volume and therefore you're going to need to calculate new concentrations for both the acid and the salt. So we would work out that those concentrations have both reduced and we would be able to substitute those in again to work out my concentration of hydrogen ions which can go into my pH calculation to give me an answer of 4.73. If you're given an acid and then a strong base, you need to think of it in terms of an equilibrium question. So start out with your full ice table. Think about your concentrations to begin with and therefore your number of moles based on that. When you add the base, think about what happens to the concentration of the acid and the salt. The salt will increase by the same number of moles as you added base. The acid will decrease by that same number of moles. So then you have um, moles at the end and you can work out new concentrations of each of those. From there you proceed exactly as you did in the previous example. The trickiest questions are those where we're then adding acid or base in a small volume to our buffer and you need to be thinking of these as equilibrium questions and remembering that whatever you add the equilibrium will shift to counteract that change. So hydroxide ions will react with hydrogen ions to make water and then the weak acid will dissociate to replace those hydrogen ions. The number of moles of acid that dissociate will be the same as the number of moles of hydroxide ions that are added. So as that acid dissociates, the concentration of the anion will increase. The moles can then be converted to new concentrations using the total volume, and we use Ka to determine the new concentration of hydrogen ion and therefore pH. So for instance, here we're given a buffer solution that's made by mixing two um, solutions together, and then we're adding some sodium hydroxide. So we start off with our initial concentrations, and we can use those to work out moles before we add the hydroxide. When we add the hydroxide, we can work out the number of moles that have been added there, and as we add that, we will reduce the acid because it dissociates to replace the hydrogen ions that have been lost, and therefore we end up making some more anions. So we can work out the moles at the end, and then based on this total um, volume here, which is 41 centimetres cubed, which we need to divide by 1,000, we can work out our new concentrations. Based on that, we can then use our Ka expression, plug in the numbers we've calculated, and we can then work out the concentration of the hydrogen ions and plug that into our pH expression to give us a pH of 4.73. Likewise, when we add acid, we need to be thinking of this as an equilibrium question and thinking about how that equilibrium will shift back to the left in order to remove those hydrogen ions. So here we have a new buffer made by mixing two solutions, and this time we're adding sulfuric acid. Watch out for that diprotic acid with its two hydrogens there. So we can again start off with our starting concentrations, work out the moles, then work out how many um, moles we're going to be adding of hydrogen ions based on the sulfuric acid. So we've got 0.0005 of sulfuric acid, which means 0.001 of hydrogen ions. So therefore the um, acid is going to increase by that concentration and the anion is going to decrease by that concentration. So we can work out moles at the end and therefore concentrations at the end Again, they go back into our Ka expression, so we can rearrange that to make hydrogen ions as the subject, put that into our pH calculation, and get an answer of 3.72. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope that you found that a useful, albeit speedy, recap of the rate equations topic. If you do want some more practice, particularly of those Arrhenius questions, there are a number of full-length videos which go into more detail and also have more practice questions.